Hello class, I'm going to tell you about the urinary system. I'll do the first 12 slides in this segment. Of course, with the urinary system, we're mostly talking about the kidneys, and the kidneys' job is to excrete fluid, um, extra water that we make in our body and extra water from our diet and drink. And by the elimination of this water, the kidneys help regulate blood volume and blood pressure. The kidneys, I'll remind you from our cardiovascular unit, are also an endocrine gland. They are the primary site for producing and releasing erythropoietin, and this will help increase red blood cell count. In physiology, you will learn that the kidneys are very important for maintaining acid base values in our body. And along with the balance of water that I've already talked about, the kidneys will help excrete extra salts in the filtrate as well as any acids and bases in order to maintain our pH. The main waste products that come out in our urine are urea which is from amino acid breakdown, uric acid which is from nucleic acid breakdown, and lastly creatinine which is basically from metabolism in the muscles. The kidneys are found roughly at the levels of T12 through L3. They are about the size of your fist or the size of a bar of soap, but who uses a bar of soap these days? They are found <clears throat> retroperitoneally, which means they're behind the peritoneal cavity. When you dissected the kidneys on your cats, you actually had to cut through the peritoneum on the back wall to pop the kidneys out before you could see the renal artery and renal veins um, going to and from the kidneys. They are not at the same level because on the right side the liver will displace the right kidney slightly inferiorly and on top of them are adrenal glands and you should remember from your endocrine chapter that the adrenal glands have both neuronal components or neural as well as um, um, hormones that are released in a hormonal way. <clears throat> Let's look at some general features of the kidney. First of all, the outer layer of the kidney is called the cortex. So this, all this outer layer here is the cortex. There is a capsule on the outer side of it, the fibrous capsule. The internal part is the medulla. So all of this region here is the medulla. These triangular or pyramidal shaped Structures are called pyramids, and they look like they have lines in them because of the tubules, and I'll talk about tubules in just a moment. So the pyramids are part of the medulla. The medulla is a region, so if you're asked in lab, name this region, you would say medulla. If you were asked to name this structure, you would say pyramid. Now there are sections where the cortex goes in between the pyramids and those are called renal columns. And a lobe <clears throat> is a medullary pyramid plus the cortical tissue around it. So how many lobes do we see in this kidney? Here's one, here's two, here's three, four, five, Six. So there are six lobes in this picture. The hilum is the indented region here where we see vessels coming and going like the renal artery and vein. The ureter uh, begins off of the renal pelvis shown here. So the renal pelvis is in the hilum leading to the ureter. And also not shown here are lymphatic vessels and nerves that can enter and exit the kidney as well. <clears throat> Continuing on with the kidney, again, here's a, another picture. Here's a renal pyramid. Here's another one. Um, we see these large 
trumpet shaped structures. Here's another one right here. This is called a major calyx. And the major calyces are starting from smaller structures that actually are at the tip of the renal papilla, or sorry, at the uh, medullary pyramid. This tip is called the renal papilla, so this is a minor calyx right there. So here's a minor leading to a major. And again, the minor calyces, just go backwards one, the minor calyx, so here's a minor calyx right here. I'm going to start this again. So here is a minor calyx on this picture. And here is a major calyx. Again, this is a renal pyramid, or medullary pyramid, and the tip of them is called the renal papilla. And the renal papilla is where the minor calyx starts. So again, here's a minor calyx, here's a minor calyx, and then they're gonna lead to a major calyx. And here's an example of minor, minor, leading to major. So minor calyces converge to form major calyces. <coughs> Excuse me, the renal pelvis is where all the major calyces converge. So right here is the renal pelvis. And then it continues out the hilum as the ureter. Now you do need to know the blood flow through the kidney, and this is also in your homework packet. If blood is delivering waste and extra water that needs to be eliminated from the body, there needs to be a way to get into the kidney and get to the structure where, where filtration will occur, which is the glomerulus. So blood enters through the renal artery, then it will branch into a segmented, sometimes called lobar artery. Then it will branch in between the lobes, called the interlobar artery. Then it will enter an arcuate artery, and arcuate arteries arc around the base of the um, renal pyramids. And then these tiny extensions going into the cortex are called interlobular artery. However, there's a newer name, cortical radians. And you will want to use that name. That's less confusing than interlobular because notice how, how easy it would be to confuse interlobar versus interlobular. Then, here's this cortical radiant shown here, right here. It's going to lead to an afferent arterial. Afferent means incoming. And then it's going to lead to a very modified capillary bed called the glomerulus. And you know that capillary beds are considered to be exchange vessels. Well, in this capillary bed, we're only going to see filtration. That means the water from the plasma leaves the capillary and enters something called Bowman's capsule or the glomerular capsule. So it leaves the capillary and goes into the capsule. And then the blood is going to exit through an efferent arterial, and then it's going to go to a second capillary bed. These capillary beds are called peritubular capillary beds, shown here, woven all around this cream-colored structure called a nephron. 
If it is a capillary bed that is following very special nephrons called juxtamedullary nephrons, these are called vasa recta, which means straight vessels. But these are still both, both are the second capillary bed. And then we get to the interlobular vein shown here, interlobular vein. And then it goes into the arcuate vein. And then the blood drains out through the interlobar vein and enters straight into the renal vein. There is no segmental nor lobar veins. And you will be asked to give a flow chart describing how a waste molecule can get into the kidneys, be filtered, and then excreted out through your urine. The basic mechanism for urine formation requires a three-step process. The first process occurs through the glomerulus, which I just spoke of, where some of the water and waste products exits the glomerulus in a process called filtration and enters Bowman's capsule, also known as the glomerular capsule. I like to think of it as a catcher's mitt catching all the extra water and waste from our blood. Then, as the filtrate goes through the different parts of the nephron, we will see reabsorption. Reabsorption means we're bringing water that we might need to save and any good stuff in our body, like glucose. We want to save that and bring that back into our blood. We do not want to urinate out glucose. If we find glucose in the urine, that's called glucose urea. And then lastly, any of the waste products that didn't happen to get filtered, they come through the peritubular capillary bed, and the cells of the nephron can actually take those solutes and put them into the nephron, and that's a process called secretion. So this this can happen to extra acids, bases, as the nephron is trying to maintain our acid-base balance. It can also be used to remove antibiotics. That's the reason why we have to take, uh, if we're on a course of antibiotics, we might need to take two or three pills a day because our kidneys will eliminate the antibiotics from our blood before they have a chance to effectively um, destroy the bacteria that might be infecting us. Now there are two different types of nephrons that we have and if you look carefully at this picture you will see that some nephrons, this cream colored structure, are very short and some are very long. The long ones are called juxtamedullary nephrons, and the short ones are called cortical. We have roughly 15 to 20 percent juxtamedullary nephrons, 85 to 80 percent cortical. And the fact that our juxtamedullary nephrons are the fewest is the reason why we can't drink seawater with impunity. If we had more juxtamedullary nephrons, we would be able to drink seawater and not have deleterious effects. We would be more like my desert tortoise, Mr. T. Our urine would be even more concentrated. It would look white, almost a cottage cheese um, texture to it, highly concentrated urine. But we don't have the majority of our nephrons being juxtamedullary. Most of them are cortical which means the maximum we can concentrate our urine is to a, a value of 1,200 milliosmolal. And physiology will learn what that means. <clears throat> um, but we won't go into that for anatomy. We need to learn the anatomy of the nephron. So shown here, we have this nephron. We've got some purple color here. We've got a pink color here, 
and we've got a green color here. And the purple color is showing you the proximal convoluted tubule, which is the first part of the nephron that comes off of Bowman's capsule, also known as the glomerular capsule. Over here in the histology picture, you could see the glomerulus, and the white thing that you're seeing around it is the glomerular capsule, the catcher's mitt, as I like to call it. In the proximal convoluted tubule, I abbreviate it as PCT, we see reabsorption, and we see secretion occurring. In the nephron loop, also known as the loop of Henle, sometimes I abbreviate that as LOH, we will see reabsorption and secretion again. In physiology, you will learn <coughs> excuse me, exactly what is reabsorbed and secreted in every part of the nephron. <coughs> and in the distal convoluted tubule, shown here in green, we see uh, this region is the target of hormone, of hormones like aldosterone and ADH. And I'll talk more about that soon. The renal corpuscle is two things combined. It's the glomerulus, which is the capillary bed, tucked within the glomerular capsule. So right here is the renal corpuscle. The renal tubule, also known as the uriniferous tubule or nephron, like I said, it has the proximal convoluted tubule, the nephron loop or loop of Henle, the distal convoluted tubule, and the collecting duct slash medullary ducts. Technically, they're not part of the renal tubule, but we're going to learn about them as if they were. Now the renal corpuscle, again, is two things. We see the glomerulus inside, and then we see Bowman's capsule, the catcher's mitt, around the glomerulus. The glomerulus is a capillary. It's a very special capillary to go back to unit two. It is a fenestrated capillary, which means it has a lot of pores and leads to rapid filtration. We filter our plasma about 80 times a day. We have an afferent arterial bringing blood to that glomerulus, and we have an efferent arterial, which is smaller, bringing blood away from the glomerulus. Now in lab, you will see models of the glomerulus, and we will ask you to identify the afferent versus efferent arterial. And again, you can, you can tell them apart because the efferent arterial is more narrow. That is important in physiology not so much important for us in anatomy. You should just know that the efferent is smaller. And again, that's not how we say efferent, right? I'm just, I'm pronouncing them differently so you can hear the difference over this audio file. The glomerular capsule, the, the, the glove, as I like to call it, has two types of epithelium. There's a parietal layer and a visceral layer. The visceral layer are these yellow looking cells. You can see their nuclei here. And those nuclei are in the middle of the cell body and then they have these little extensions, these little feet like extensions called pedicels. And that's why these cells are called podocytes, because they look like they have feet. And they wrap their little feet around the glomerulus. So that's the visceral layer. And they contribute to the filtration membrane. The filtration membrane is the glomerulus, which has simple squamous endothelium. Then we have a basement membrane
which is protein. And then on the other side, we have these podocytes. which wrap around the glomerulus, but I'm not drawing it like that. They're nuclei. And they are the parietal layer. Sorry. Yeah. Visceral layer of the filtration membrane. Now the parietal layer of the glomerular capsule is simple squamous epithelium. And you'll notice that there is a space in between here. So this is where the filtrate accumulates and drips, much like your coffee maker, into the proximal convoluted tubule. So again, the three parts of the filtration membrane. We have our podocyte, we can see its pedicils wrapping around the glomerulus. Here are the fenestrations of the simple squamous endothelium. And what you can't really see here very well is this basement membrane in between those two layers. Now a lot of people think that the reason why we don't filter our plasma proteins from the blood into the glomerular space is because that the filtration slits are too small to allow the plasma proteins to leak out. And that's not true. It's not just size exclusion. So that's kind of a myth. It's not that. It's because of that basement membrane, it's really important. That sheet of protein, because it's protein and plasma proteins, our proteins obviously and our blood pH is 7.40 proteins in our body have a charge that is negative and so we get charge exclusion same charges repel if you've taken chemistry you know that already so that's the reason why we don't filter our proteins. We should not find protein in our urine. If we do, that's called proteinuria. Now we're gonna take a trip through our nephron. Here's our proximal convoluted tubule. And this is where we're going to see, we're gonna see 65% to 67% reabsorption of sodium and water. So 65% water, 67% sodium. We will also see secretion. So this slide is not quite right. We will also see secretion. Then we're gonna go into the loop of Henle or nephron loop. There is a descending limb first, followed by a hairpin turn and then an ascending limb, there's a thin and a thick. So the filtrate goes down and then it moves around the hairpin turn and goes back up. Now I keep saying filtrate. Filtrate is not plasma, but it comes from plasma. That's not something new to us. We learned that cerebral spinal fluid comes from plasma, but it's not identical. We also learned that aqueous humor comes from plasma, but it's not identical. So filtrate comes from plasma, but it's not identical. Filtrate should not have proteins in it. Oops. No proteins. It should not. I didn't say it will not. I said it should not. And then we have our late distal convoluted tubule and early. So there are two different parts. There's early and late. In lab, we don't really care that you know early or late, but the early part is the first part, and the late part is the second part. In physiology, knowing those two parts is very important. And then we get to the collecting duct, and getting deeper, it goes to the medullary duct 
and then even deeper it goes to the papillary duct. So that's part of the collecting system. It's not technically part of the nephron. But when we study the nephron, <coughs> we include the collecting system parts. So please have a very good idea of this picture. You might even want to make sure that you have it so you can take notes on it as we continue our trip through the nephron bit by bit. And when I see you in class, um, I will record the rest of this lecture live. We'll go through the loop, I, or sorry, we'll go through the nephron. I'll draw the picture of the nephron on the board <clears throat> and we will itemize uh, parts of the nephron, like what kinds of cells do they have. That's important for histology and lab. And we'll briefly talk about the functions of those different parts of the nephron. Okay, that's it for section number one for our renal system.